Well, let's talk about maybe, I mean, there's so many ways we could go with this. Maybe some of the biggest things that piss you off, like that you see that are just huge misconceptions or myths that you see across the board. Like, oh, dude, that's so not true. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot. Like, yeah. I mean, strength and conditioning, powerlifting, chiro chiropractic, um, just the fitness community in general, like the online coaching, the oversaturate, like the oversaturation of that. Discerning price and value mm -hmm. might be something that is like an overarching topic where, you know, you're going to have someone pay for a product and they're going to see what they think to be a lateral product in the market for cheaper. And they mm -hmm. don't understand why your product is more expensive. Yeah. If you don't understand the difference between price and value. And in our space, it's also the difference. And you might run into this is the difference between notoriety and credibility. Mm -hmm. And that's that to me is that's the social that is the social revenue construct or parallel of differentiating value and price. Value and price is very monetary in the social market. Like if we look at Instagram, like a, like what are you trading at today? What are your followers? That's consumer trust in the market is basically yeah. what a following is, right? So people conflate notoriety with credibility. Just because someone has a million followers does not mean they know what the fuck they're talking right. about, right? Totally. So one would argue that might be an inverse relationship. So the big thing I stick with is like you're, you're, you pick a coach or you pick or you get programming from someone because they have a lot of followers like that to me is something that, but that there is a narrowing gap between people who have a million followers and people who have a million dollars, right? It's hard to not have that kind of social capital and not somehow accrue that kind of revenue in your in your business yeah but right. i will say to people who are chasing followers there are a lot of people with a million followers who don't know how to make money oh don't sure make any money. Yeah. yeah and then the inverse is also true there's yeah. a lot of big businesses in especially in our space yeah. that are fucking sleeping giants yeah that no one knows oh, like the totally. sales funnels right. like i, mean, I have a couple of friends that run unbelievably oh, yeah. successful million dollar businesses mm -hmm. and like their instagram account is but they run the same conversion percentages that I run with my very small podcast and business. Yeah. So that's what kind of gives me hope with yeah. at least podcasting anyways, is like that's because it's a more intimate medium. I'm spending an hour with you every day in your car. Yeah. My wife can't even do that <laughs> with me. She's like, you're taking the fucking bus, get an Uber. I don't want to listen to you. Where it's like, that's a softer sell than like, you know, hey, promo code, click link in bio for yeah. training. It's like that doesn't fucking I mean, yeah, if you have a million people, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna skim off the top a couple percent. Yeah. But if you have if you grow that like kind of and dare I use the California word organically mm -hmm. and you have that interaction, then you'll be able to scale actually and maybe even improve your conversion rate as you improve your actual um, subscribership or downloads. Yeah. But for me it's the overarching themes people conflating notoriety with credibility it's mm -hmm. like that's why i lose sleep at night trying to gain both it's like i'll get i mean i would face the argument yeah but so and so squats this much like, all right fuck i gotta just gotta get i guess i gotta get stronger than that guy <laughs> to prove that i'm smarter than him yeah or then oh so and so is a, a an orthopedic surgeon it's like all right, I'll, I'll go like study orthopedics, like, you know yeah, what I mean? Or yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll consult with or I'll mentor with someone like that. And it's overcoming objectives, like um, people's barriers of entry to whatever it is you're trying to sell them. Yeah. And you shouldn't really do that. Like you shouldn't chase your tail in that sense, but it does make you better. Like if I could just wake up tomorrow, uh, maybe it's not true, but like hypothetically, if I could wake up tomorrow and not have to try and squat 800 pounds, I wouldn't mind kicking my feet up, but like, honestly, when I'm third attempt on the platform, like my thought is if you lift this life financially might be a little bit easier. Mm. Like it'll help grow your following. It'll help prove that you know what you're talking about, mm. even though the diploma or whatever, doesn't really matter to most people, yeah. especially maybe more so in the fitness industry than other spaces. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, that's one of my biggest things. Like we could go down the rabbit hole of like, Theraguns or like self myofascial release or all this crap, but like the overarching themes, that's one of them. It's just like, I I feel like I was sold a false bill of goods. Like get smart, go to school, get a degree, you'll be fine. Okay. And then it's just like, oh shit. Yeah. But now it makes it fun though. I mean, it, it, like if you were at the top of the hill, it's like, what do you do? Right. Yeah. So I couldn't imagine not having to be forced to do this because like this is me kind of working right now. Right. Not, yeah. not a bad. As he looks out at the view yeah, of the yeah. ocean, not a bad gig. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some some concepts specifically. Like you mentioned self-myofascial release. What's yeah. your take on that? People, um, people you, overdo it. You don't pay a plumber to bang on the pipes. You pay him to know which pipes to bang on. 
right? That's kind of the way I look at it. It's self-myofascial release, Theragun, lacrosse ball. Like Kelly Stratt has effectively sold more lacrosse balls than the game of lacrosse, <laughs> right? right? People are aware of that. Yeah. And I'm no knock to Kelly because I think Kelly's role comes from a place of simplification for the sake of utilization, right? He knows it's more complex than that, mm -hmm. but he knows if he tries to break down the the physiological pathways and maybe make it a little bit more in depth to try and make it 100% as effective as he could, he'll maybe only reach 30% of the people, yep. right? So I think Definitely. that's a conscious decision that you have to respect with someone yeah. like that. But like when the Theragun thing, for example, drives me nuts. Because like I've had people come to me and go, oh, no, no, I'm good. Like I don't need to like, oh, you know, I'm going to cancel my appointment. I bought a $600 Theragun. It's like, yes, and you're never allowed back in my office again. <laughs> well, it's like... Oh, no, I, I bought a toothbrush. I don't want to go see my dentist yeah, anymore. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's right. adorable. Uh, I think <laughs> it's adorable. I think it's overdone. I think it's potentially dangerous. Like, you don't – people don't pay me in my office to poke and prod or adjust. They pay me to know when to not to, mm -hmm. right? And that's a huge distinction, and that's, cl that's critical clinical thinking where it's like what you're feeling is a referral pattern from a visceral organ. Your shoulder pain is your gallbladder. You need to go get you need to go get a liver panel done, and you need to go to the hospital. That's the difference. When you're going to look cross all that, and you're going to send sell someone that, oh, you just put a theragun in it, or you could be palliating something that the the clock is ticking, right? And that's where I have a problem. Is like these un unspecialized movement people. It's like you took a weekend course. It's like you're not going to know the difference between like a multiple myeloma and the presentation of like a hemangioma. Yeah. You're just going to think put a lacrosse ball in it or do some vinyasa flow. It's yeah. like, are you fucking serious? And, <laughs> but it happens. People laugh, but it's like it's not funny when that's you. It's not sure. funny when that that lack of depth and attention to detail leads to something that could have been screened for earlier, right? So yeah. it's a weird thing to like blow out to that like that magnitude, but when it happens, you'd wish you hadn't put a lacrosse ball there. You mm. wish the Theragun would have been able to tell you that, no, you need to go get like blood work done, right? So I think that's my biggest thing is like, nine times out of 10, this thumb, this elbow is a well-placed lacrosse ball, mm. right? But that's the plumber, plumber knowing what pipes to bang on, right? right? Your knee hurts, I'm not gonna take a Theragun to your knee. It's not gonna happen, people will do that, We'll work on the hip, we'll introduce some, and here's a big thing is introducing stability, which I think is such an overlooked where like the point and shoot model of self myofascial release is a really good model for the guy selling the myofascial release, yeah. but it's not, it doesn't come with it that, that, that critical thought process of why, right? It's just point and shoot, right? So you could in the very short term pre-workout be down regulating a stimulus of pain that'll allow you to load a weight that you should be perceiving that pain greater and actually put you in a position where you can damage that joint more mm. because you're not, pain is a light on the dashboard, right? You don't change the fucking bulb every time the light goes off or put a piece of tape over it. You actually check the engine, yeah. but you need yeah. to know too many people are selling tools, not enough people are reading manuals, right? Yeah. Give me a brad nailer and a compressor. You're not gonna want me to frame your house. It's the same thing, right? And that's like what I'm left with in practice is I'm left with unpacking benign neglect at the hands of self myofascial release tools. It's like if you would have came to me three months ago rather than that Theragun, we would have been on back under the bar in two weeks. Now I'm gonna have to send you over an MRI and we might have to consult with surgery and then see how you rehab after that. Worth the 600 bucks, worth like not coming to see someone who knows the difference. That's kind of in the eye of the beholder, but my biggest thing is like there is not, I don't know if it's malicious. Like I think the people who are selling them actually believe in the efficacy, but they're not people who, you know, practice manual medicine. So they just kind of, they believe in the business model. Yeah. And it's like, I understand you're trying to help people, but if you're setting them up for just a prolonged disaster, you're actually doing them a disservice. Now, what do you say to the, the opposite side of the coin where people would say, uh, if you train properly, and you mentioned stability there, which I yeah. want to get into. If you train properly and, 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 and train stability properly, all that shit's a waste of time. You don't need any SMR or anything like that. So it's an extreme opposite. Uh, yeah, and spectrum. you know what? I think, I mean, any port in the storm, uh, I think if people hold fast to that outlook, like that's a pretty old school yeah. way of looking at it. I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Sure. Like when the, when the pendulum kind of stops oscillating, you'll realize that. I look at it just like, 
you know, like game when you're a kid and you like flip over cards and try to remember where the matching card was. Yeah. It's about finding, and this is like, you know, how many answers, how many questions you get asked that the answer starts with immediately. Okay, that depends. Right. Right. So I think just as the myofascial zealots are maybe overshooting, I think the old school, like hard knock, single ply, rah, foam rollers, whatever. I think they're maybe missing some potential benefit of like a neurological downregulation. Yeah. Um, I think there's a and, and I'm not even talking specifically so much of that those guys, more guys who are like, um, well, if you train properly and you address stability and you, you know, train with proper muscle yeah. function and all that, you shouldn't need to roll and do all that stuff quite as much. I don't think they're equating for most people's main input or stimulus input, which is usually their lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? Like you can do that, sure, 168 hours in a week. You're training properly with good position and stability for, you know, maybe eight hours if you're lucky, yeah. right? If you're self-employed like us, we could maybe train for eight hours a week. Yeah, I think the the unnatural positions that most people are in for the other 160 hours a week yeah. puts them in a position where extra physiological demand of like increasing like the perception of mobility or the down regulation of the perception of pain in certain positions i think it's borderline from my experience irrefutable like mm -hmm. i don't think you can I don't think because it's subjective right like it's it's pain is it is what you feel it is right like some people's pain scales like i've when i worked corporate i would have people come in and be like it's like a 10 out of 10. And it's like i tore my pec off the bone with 441 pounds and the bar landed on my chest that was like a six what if i punched you in the <laughs> face tell me again about your low back pain being a 10 out of 10. like yeah. oh okay maybe it's like a two yeah so it's like but with the myofascial release, like if it works, it works. Yeah. Right. If it doesn't work for you, then that's fine. But I think if you were to say that someone who subscribes to the idea or puts that into practice isn't reaping a benefit from it and they say they are, they're right. Mm. You're not right. You can't tell them that they don't feel better because of it. Yeah. You can question the physiological action, but how much of training is psychological, right? If someone has to like, I'm not a big running proponent. But if someone comes into my office and says, hey, I want to run a marathon this year, sweet, I'm all in, right? That's not the greatest thing on your body in like a million different ways, but psychological is going to drive the physiological, right? Sure. So if you want to do it, we'll get you there, right? We will find a way to do it with the least possible likelihood of injury, but it would be against my better judgment to try and do it. But again, this is what steers the ship. Um, I just think it's people are just speaking in absolutes to have a voice, mm -hmm. right? Because you know what doesn't sell? That depends. Right. Right. Totally. To, to take, you can't sell a logical reason. You, you can if you're a university and you sell four year degrees and four year doctor degrees. You can sell that. But yep. anyone shy of, anyone not willing to go in and, and dig that deep, they want, they want a camp. And then the exclusion criteria just becomes their particular experience with whatever the input is, whatever the training stimulus is. People respond really well to kettlebells. All of a sudden, they're carrying a kettlebell with them on the bus. It's like, all right, ease up a bit. But the exclusion criteria wasn't made on the incoming. It was the output. Is it, did this work for you? And that's kind of another sticking point I have is sometimes barbell work's not the best for some people. Mm -hmm. You know, squatting isn't, I'm going to air quote natural because I don't think it's essentially natural. It's an economical loading pattern. Do you have to be low bar squatting into your 50s? If you have herniated discs in your back, maybe not. But it's some people will find their way to the other side of that, and they'll swear by it, and they'll swear by it for everyone because it worked for them. Right. Yeah, but yeah. it's like exclusion criteria. Like people come into my office, like I don't think you're a good candidate to be here, right? Like, and that's exclusion criteria set out because my end goal, whether it's me getting you better or someone else, it's the fact that you get better. Yeah. Right. So being able to screen out, like, you know, is a mile fat? Is this gonna work for me? Well, it depends what your pain is, right? Like, if your pain is coming from you have chondromalacia patella, I don't think the foam roller is gonna work, right? So people just don't understand that exclusion criteria, so they end up just throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about kind of simplify for everybody the difference between mobility, <laughs> stability, flexibility. Sure. I think there's some confusion there, and then how that relates to strength. Yeah, I think mobility, yeah, because it's it's such it's buzzword marketing tools now, yeah. right? Like it is what like functional was ten years ago, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is still gets conflated because the difference between like like function and action, but that's a whole nother that's a whole nother kind of rabbit hole we could go down. But mobility is freedom to get into an end range of motion, right? Now 
the biggest thing that gets missed, I think, like is the stability component. And stability, this is where the market takes over. So stability gets, again, we have to sell something to people, right? So you're gonna get two ends. You're gonna get someone that tries to sell you resistance to build muscles of stability. You're gonna get someone that says, and also on the other end, you're gonna get someone that sells you extra physiological demands of instability as a stimulus. So what I mean by that is, take your hip circle, right? So I'm gonna try and say this as politically correct as I can, but like a banded hip abduction Mm -hmm. work. If you're gonna be a bikini chick, God bless you. And it, it'll work to a certain extent. It's almost like a Venn diagram, right? Where muscle isolation, regardless of the muscle action, is going to increase some level of hypertrophy, which will carry over to performance to a certain extent, right? But how much are we worried about performance and how much are we worried about aesthetics is going to indicate whether we should be training function or action, right? Because that glute med, I always go to the glute med. The glute med is a prime example because especially in Southern California, it's always beach season. That's something people are focusing on. You know, how many times you see that like Jane Fonda hip abduction against the band or the guys yeah. walking with the band around their hips. Yeah, yeah. Muscles of stability. So the stability is the body's ability to resist force. Strength is the body's ability to exert force. Mobility is the freedom of range of motion, right? So the thing with st- stability that's interesting is it has to be, it's positionally related, right? Like I can't train stability of my shoulder here. I can train strength. I can train the strength of my rotator cuff. But for me to be, train stability functionally, I have to be here. So if I don't have the mobility to get here, then I can't train stability, right? So it's kind of like... The shoulder is an easy example because it's just an arc. Very structurally stable, very function, very low demand for functional stability. Very structurally unstable, high demand for functional stability. But you have to. So it's just for people who are yeah, listening, yeah, not yeah. watching. Your arm is overhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're in the overhead position, yeah. like if I were to write a book on how to dislocate a shoulder, chapter one would be put your arm overhead. Most people even feel so. I mean, for those listening, and this is always a test I do. Everyone make a fist right now with their arms at their sides. Squeeze as hard as you can. Then put your arm overhead, squeeze as hard as you can. Where do you feel stronger in your grip? Everyone kind of defaults to the arm of the side. The muscles that contribute to our grip strength start from at most our medial epicondyle and down, your elbow and down, essentially. Intrinsic muscles of the hand, that's where you're going to get your grip strength from. Then why is it you felt weaker or that, that there was a limitation in your ability to express strength in the overhead position? Not enough functional stability trend. Because it's in a structurally unstable position, your brain is always keeping an inventory of where your stability is at. And that value always has to be met at 100%. So here, 100% structural stability, roughly speaking, we can get 100% output. As we trade off that structure for function, if we haven't trained the isolated stimulus of instability, rather than training strength, then we're not going to be able to exert force past what our brain perceives to be an increasingly dangerous position to load. So basically it down regulates the perception of the muscle or the ability of the muscle to close or like to shorten. So we can't do damage structurally to the shoulder. So stability to me is like, it is emblematic of a lot of things in the fitness industry where they go too far one way, mm-hmm. BOSU balls, yeah. balance boards, wobble boards. It's like unless your neighborhood is lined with BOSU balls and wobble boards, <laughs> it's a skill adaptation, yeah. right? Like it's not going to carry over to the ice. It's not going to carry over to gymnastics or anything like that. It's going to make you better if your sport is standing on a wobble board. Mm. But on the other side, like the hip circle, the booty bands or whatever, Aesthetically, sure, and like I maintain there's a, a slight overlap in gaining cross-sectional area of a muscle and that muscle's ability to perform, but you're training that muscle's action, which is to, in the glute meds example, abduct and externally rotate, but its function is to balance laterally your hip onto your pelvis, right? To stand on one leg and not fall over, because when we're walking, we stop that lateral shift from happening so we can actually keep going. So for me, it's stability is the most misunderstood because when people think they're training stability, they're just training the action of muscles that are meant to stabilize, right? The rotator cuff progression. Someone grabs a band, elbow at the side. They're training a muscle that works around a Y axis, right? Gravity comes straight down. So like if you're sitting next to someone, take your thumb into the back of their armpit and jam it, like right into the Terry's minor tendon. It hurt like a, mu- like if you ever get in a fight in an alley and you wanna put someone down quick, just go right into the Terry's minor, like right into that axillary fold, they'll go down. Because if you haven't trained something, like no one looks at me and goes, I bet you he's a good runner, right? Yeah. I haven't trained the stimulus of anaerobic conditioning. I'm frankly out of breath talking right now. <laughs> but, but like put a barbell on my back with a couple hundred pounds, 
no, I won't be sore. Yeah. Right? I, I've, I've adapted to that stimulus. It's the same with stability where it's like, if I'm always strength training and I go for a run, I'm going to be sore. Mm-hmm. If I'm always strength training and my muscles need to stabilize and it's an increasing unstable load, I'm still going to be sore. Where it's like, I could take someone's, I could take my elbow and jam it in someone's hamstring. They're fine. It works right through the sagittal plane. It flexes against the load of gravity. So the role or the function and the action is different when muscles work around that circumferential axis, right? Glute mean, it's an external rotator. Lateral, the piriformis is a lateral rotator. The teres minor, the infraspinatus, they all work around this axis. At no point is this ever going to, more often than not, this will not come into a point where it has to exert force. It does, however, have to resist force so the prime movers can exert force effectively. I think once you nail that piece in training, everything becomes a lot easier. And that's where, I mean, doubling back to like the fitness industry and online coaching and all that. If there's a movement prep protocol, that usually isn't part of it. Mm -hmm. It's like do some rotator cuff stuff or do some like static stretching or whatever. But I think if you want to train and get stronger over a long period of time, you get that right. That'll, that'll unlock your mobility. Like over time, like you get a construction worker that this is his overhead mobility his brain does not trust his ability to stabilize this joint past this position. That's why it's cast him functionally in this 150 degrees of shoulder flexion. And so he could waste hours and hours and hours training for mobility when he should be working on his stability. He will, because his body will be uncertain of his ability to stabilize that end range that last 30 degrees. So how does someone properly, can you give some examples of how oh, sure. someone can yeah. properly train stability? So, I mean, mobility does have to be a part of it, mm-hmm. but it's, I mean, because you're going to hear the same, inf- like the same infinite feedback back loop. I don't get it. I stretch all the time is the number one thing you're going to hear from people who are immobile. And the number one people thing you're going to hear from people who are unstable. I stretch all the time. It's like, exactly. You stretch into this, what your body perceives to be an extra physiological range of motion. Your body basically goes, what the fuck am I doing here? We haven't been here in like since college. And then wait, what the fuck are we doing here under all this weight? Yeah. Right. So then immediately it perceives a threat to that joint in that position. And your body goes, shut it down, shut it down. We can't, we can't handle this. So it tightens everything up again. So then what do you do? You go in the gym, you still have this shitty shoulder range of motion. You stretch again enough to get you onto the bench press and maybe get your b- b- the bar to your chest and then do it again. And you do it again. Where if, if you can add in a tributary of isolated stability training in the transient position of that unstable joint position that you've created by doing your mobility work, then load it, then you start breaking the cycle. Then your mobility starts to improving, improve at rest because you're doing it at a time under the most stress. Because you'll see that same thing in like the flip side of the coin is someone who's really mobile with no strength, right? And that's big these days. It's become like a separate parlor trick in itself. <laughs> it's like someone doesn't have the discipline enough to get strong, so they think that, well, if I'm just really gumby, that'll be impressive too, mm-hmm. which is equally as dangerous. Like everyone thinks everything in the fitness industry or in really any industry is uh, like an inverse correlation, right? Like the likelihood of injury is going to decrease as my mobility increases. False. Give me someone in the Cirque du Soleil and give me someone who does like highway construction, Uh equally likely to get injured. You, the idea is in that inverted bell curve distribution, figuring out what side you're trending to and then doing the requisite work to bring you back. That, you know, that stretching guy mm-hmm. who's like can put himself in a box and fold himself in the overhead compartment on the airplane, he needs to be stronger. He needs more contractility. He has plenty of elasticity. He needs to move that force back into the curve where it's managed functionally by the muscle and the stress isn't being put on the tendons, the ligaments, the joint capsules, the discs, right? Because he's sure he can get into these positions, but you can't exert strength there. And on the flip side of that, the guy who can't put his shoes on in the morning, yeah, like he could bend over to put like put on a shoe and blow out his back. He needs more mobility. It's about figuring out that inverted bell curve on the distribution and getting people dead center. And then like that is not a self evident process. A lot of people just think stretch, 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 stretch. There's a place for it. Sure. There's also been a bit of a bastardization of like stretching research. So either people avoid it altogether or they do it too much without the requisite stability work to follow. So it's how do you integrate mobility, stability, and strength? That's kind of the art of it. Yeah. And do you have some commonly prescribed stability exercises that are your go-tos for certain areas of the body? Um, I have like, I call them like gatekeeper exercises. Uh So I have them for myself where it's like if I can't do 
before I bench press, if I can't do a kettlebell bottom under press with 40 pounds okay. for reps, I'm not bench pressing. Okay. Which is basically like the kettlebell bottom under press is like elbow tucked in, kettlebell kind of inverted. So you're grabbing the handle and the bell's over top. And the idea here, the trick here is a lot of people abduct the shoulder. They turn yeah. it into like a kettlebell bottom under military press. Yeah. My hand is going to be expressive of rotation of my shoulder. So right now, my elbow's tucked in on my side, kind of shoulders a bit protracted, elbow and shoulder at 90 degrees. When I press overhead, my hand is expressing 90 degrees of rotation in my shoulder. That's not self-evident at the actual shoulder itself, but I'm not pronating or supinating my wrist at all. I'm allowing that hand to be fully expressive of that rotation of the shoulder. Rotator cuff. You have to be training rotation. So if you're out here, no rotation. Mm. You're, this is this is the difference between a strong shoulder and a stable shoulder, right? So I think kettlebell bottom under press is good because it's it's all encompassing of shoulder mechanics. Sure. Like it it gets it makes sure the scapula is moving properly and make sure the thoracic spine is moving properly. Like if you have a shoulder blade like this, you'll get to about 120 degrees, and then you'll have to abduct to move around that elevated shoulder blade, right? And then from there, it's it's easily scalable for athletes because again, it's the difference between exerting force and resisting force is the difference between strength and stability. When you put a heavier kettlebell in your hand, it's a more unstable load. Like I have guys that are good for four or 500 pounds overhead, 40 pound kettlebell, less than 10% yeah. will humble them, right? And what'll happen, that like that grip thing that I just talked about, mm -hmm. you'll notice people will get to the top and the kettlebell will fall back on their forearm. Right. What happened? My wrist is weak. It's like, dude, you deadlift 900 pounds. Your wrist is not weak. <laughs> yeah. Because wrist weakness is, A, the actual wrist itself is just, it's almost like your ankle. It's all structural stability. It's that neurological down regulation coming from your shoulder saying, hey, anything past this unstable thing, drop it because you're going to hurt the shoulder. Right. So that's one I like for upper body. And for lower body, it's like anything gait cycle, it's like walking lunge, single leg RDL. Because I look at it like hip. And I mean, I'm a power lifter but I don't think squatting is functional because if we think about like evolutionary biology, like 3.2 billion years ago, one ape decided now's the time we're going to start walking. Mm -hmm. Right? So when that, when Lucy Australopithecus decided that that's how we were going to go through locomotion, we weren't going to kind of crawl around on our knuckles anymore. It changed the, the way the hips function in the sense that that's how they meant to operate. So there's a reciprocal motion when we walk, like when I take my left foot forward, my left ilium is going to posteriorly tilt to allow for that flexion moment to happen. And inversely on my right side, anterior tilt extension of the femur. So when people look like this is kind of goes to your point about like the old school people who are just like, don't need mobility work, don't need stability work, just like do the main movement. Like my warm up, what do you do to warm up for your squat? Squat. Yeah. Like, if you think of, if you have hip or knee pain from squatting and that's your, like that is your prep work mm -hmm. think of it this way like if i gave you if i gave you a, like a a 38 and said i want you to i don't know shoot that pitcher mm -hmm. be able to hit it right mm -hmm. it's, it's five feet away yeah that's assessing the requisite mobility and stability of your hips or the the potential of your uh, mobility and stability of your hips in a squat right it's it's such a narrow window of what we're actually capable of doing at our hips and our knees if i put that pitcher, you know, 200 yards out in the ocean. Yeah. And I said, all right, I want you to hit it. Give you the same 38 and hit it. That's assessing the requisite mobility and stability to meet it and demanded of the actual hip themselves as they function. Right. So if we can, before we're going to bring this in here, because if I said the only objective criteria is to hit that and it's five feet away, even if you're just skimming the edges, you're still getting a green light. You're still getting a little green check mark. Yeah. If we're trending off course here and we haven't been screening that distal that distal trajectory mm -hmm. with the unilateral gait cycle movements, how our hips actually function, then we'll all of a sudden one day, oh, I don't get it. I've been doing the same thing forever. It's like, exactly. You've been trending off course of bullseye for so long because you haven't actually calibrated. You haven't calibrated your stability. You haven't calibrated your mobility. So when you do that every time, when you bring it back into the narrow parameters, the narrow demand of range of motion, mobility and stability of the hips required in the squat you're never going to worry about trending off course because you've trained the function at, at at the peripheral so you're always recalibrated in the center so those are my two big ones for upper kettlebell bottom under press 
it's easy once you get into the position it's easy to maintain it's it's easily scalable because it's all encompassing of shoulder mobility and we're not, that's not just ball and socket that's yeah. scapular thoracic that's ac that's sc that's thoracic extension even breathing to a certain extent will help improve on the execution and then single leg rdl it's look at how the hips are meant to function not how you put them through action and so if you can calibrate them before you lift you're good so like walking lunge single leg rdl hip airplane if you can't stand on one leg you have no business squatting with two mm. it's a general rule of thumb yeah because it's like stability will come from structure or function if you don't train adequate function like and you're squatting a lot the structure that picks up si joint if you're lucky lumbar disc most common so you want to get a herniated disc that's the structure that's now going to be buffering the force that your hip stability isn't but you're hiding that instability that inaccuracy of the in the close parameters the close demand the narrow uh the narrow scope that you have to actually be able to work within to fulfill the objective criteria of squatting right it doesn't take much stability to sink down into a squat it does take a lot of stability to do a single leg RDL hip airplane, but yeah. if you can get that piece right, you never have to worry. Do about Do you have a, a go-to variation of that, or do you do work? Do you like to work through different progressions of the single leg RDL? So the hip one's interesting because here's what you're always going to get: people they'll go back and they'll start conflating resistance and or strength and stability. A Bulgarian split squat with dumbbells in both hands is equally as unstable as a Bulgarian split squat with a dumbbell with or no dumbbells at all, right? So everyone's like, "Oh yeah, I do I do unilateral stuff all the time." What you don't realize is, or a lot of people don't realize, is the stimulus has to scale. A bird dog is a great spinal stability exercise, mm -hmm. right? It's really, it's really sophisticated when you look at like the mechanism of correction, like using the thoracolumbar fascia. But it's so simple. All right, here we're just gonna make sure opposite arm, opposite leg. It, like it's through the thoracolumbar fascia. It's really interesting how it works, but a bird dog is not going to evoke enough spinal stability for someone who squats five, 600 pounds, yeah. right? So people do that. They go to a, a run of the mill chiropractor, physical therapist who doesn't take, who doesn't scale that stimulus of stability for them. It's like last time I checked, I squat with two feet on the ground, not in a quad pet position. So we need to have something that scales up. So you can go single or you can go bird dog to single leg RDL. Then it comes down to, okay, we can use resistance unilaterally loaded, put a dumbbell in one hand and then use that dumbbell as a progression of the deviation of a combined center of gravity, right? Because that's the thing, like when a bar is on your back, that's why your back squat's different than your front squat. Mm -hmm. You and the bar have a combined center of gravity that you need to keep within a base of support. So if I'm trying to progress like a single leg RDL, the majority of people will load the hand of the hip that's an extension, right? It's, mm -hmm. It feels natural, it's gait cycle, essentially. This hip is going into flexion, this shoulder's going into flexion. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something I'll do moving into season like with athletes and as an attenuated progression so i'll go from no weight weight in one hand the hand of the hip that's an extension then to deviate outside of the support you go the opposite that's your lateral shift right when someone squats in the bottom position or in the bottom position of the squat they deviate one side that's glute meat on one side roughly speaking there's a lot of reasons for it glute meat on one side ql on the opposite side when you load that you're reinforcing that pattern so you'll see some people who are really biased on one side and this will pick them apart like whoop 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 because it's that deviation of the center of gravity so it's you can use resistance to progress in stability if you're progressing it unilaterally if the progression is a deviation of a center of gravity and not so much bilateral load because if i put a dumbbell in each one of my hands it's quad and hamstrings are just on trial, but it's like I can you know, squat north of 700 pounds. I'm not going to have 350 pounds in each one of my hands. Yeah. So I'm not really going to be taxing my quads and hamstrings. Let's lean into the unstable loading parameter by making it more unstable. Right. So that's kind of how I would go about doing it is be mindful of the way you're doing it because the mechanism of correction is very much predicated on the loading pattern that you choose. So that was just Bulgarian split squat. It gets different again when you load single leg RDL. Now we're hinging our hip or we're hinging our torso and leaving our hip on the ground rather than staying torso neutral and then moving the hip. So it, it seems complicated, but if you're trying to really make progress, it's what I deem to be the necessary amount of detail you need to go into to be able to progress your strength and do it without getting hurt. If you have an average guy, let's say he works at the Apple store, yeah. 30 to 50 years old, do you find yourself not programming like the big four lifts? Is is it more unilateral stuff at first? I mean, obviously it depends on the yeah. person, but do you have a general kind of? Uh, so like 
I, again, a lot of my progressions will come from range of motion. Mm -hmm. Cause like the big problem we run into is like, imagine this, this like a uh, switchboard mm -hmm. was controlling our input to our nervous system. Mm -hmm. This is governed that only so much can go into it at once. Like mm -hmm. that's like when you, you're texting and you're driving and the windows down and the music's on. If you put your window up and you turn your music on, it seems like a, or turn the music off. It seems like a doable task because there's only so much sensory input we can manage yeah. before. And it's the same thing with lifting, but lifting is usually so oversimplified to just two knobs, volume and intensity, mm -hmm. right? So here's what people will put a bar on your back. We're going to low bar and we're just going to go and we're going to scale as we go heavier. We're going to bring the reps down. Like, all right. So whether you're just learning to lift or whether you're coming back from an injury, those are the two toggles that we play with. For me, when it comes to like overhead press, bench press, um, deadlift and squat, it's trying to make as many variations as we can to the main movement that keep relative load down. So I'm not trying to load them with a lot of weight. I'm going to try them to load them with a lot of instability. So for me, like a squat, for example, I want to layer in because a lot of people, if they're listening and they're like personal trainers or they're strength coaches, I, again, you, you can have the best exercise in the world, but if you don't get buy-in and it's not fun and there's not a progression, yeah, totally, you know, we're shit, right? So I'm not going to be like, all right, we're not going to squat until you can do a single leg RDL. Yeah. It's like, all right, I'm not paying for these concessions anymore. Right. So it's like layering in like, okay, we're going to counterbalance squat. So finding what their load tolerance is, finding what their stability tolerance is, and finding a sub-maximal stimulus for each that we can start to make strides without breaking down, right? Like if I wanted to bench 600, the last thing I would do is put 600 on the bar. Whew, right down the chest, ah oh, shit, this again. If I wanted to get someone to do a Bulgarian split squat unilaterally loaded or a hip airplane, controlling their own body weight on one hip as they kind of open up, the last thing I would do is start them there, right? So it's finding out where can we push them, where do they start breaking down? Same, same with strength, like how much can you bench? All right, let's take a very attenuated stimulus of that. Let's take a lesser stimulus of that so we can accrue sub-maximal load regardless of what stimulus we're working on. Um, so for the squat, for example, counterbalance squat. Hold a weight out here. You're going to be limited by how much your shoulders can hold up. Yeah. And the thing with that is uh, that'll be actually a teaching tool because too many people, when they learn to squat, they've been sold on the idea that squats are bad for the knees. So the last thing they want to do is break in the knee. Then you have that sit way back, anterior tilt, shear mm -hmm. the SI joint. Mm -hmm. When you're holding a weight right out front of you, the combined center of gravity of that plate in your SI joint, the second you start to sit back out of the gate, your body tells you that's not a good idea. You're mm -hmm. increasing the moment arm between the actual the load in the SI joint. So what you want to do is teach them it's okay to break in your knees. It's only going to be a five pound plate, a 10 mm -hmm. pound plate. So you liberate them to actually start cueing proper squat mechanics rather than keeping that parallel shin. Mm -hmm. Then as we move into patterns where we can actually start loading more weight, goblet squat with a dumbbell or a kettlebell, front squat with a barbell, high bar with a barbell, then into the low bar. Each one of those graduations of load is predicated by a graduation of stability layered underneath that. So based off where they started, that could be really quick based or it could be something really slow. You have an elderly client who, you know, lives in a single, single floor unit, doesn't even walk upstairs. She's going to be on counterbalance squat or even like a, like an assisted TRX squat for a while. Okay. But once she goes from like walk stationary lunge to walking lunge, then we can start bringing the weight in. There's been a requisite improvement of stability to allow her to move and be able to exert more force without worrying about the structure being compromised. Then when she goes from walking lunge to walking lunge in a single leg RDL, let's put a bar on her. Let's front squat her. Let's high bar squat her. So each one of those kind of has a layered graduation, always predicated on the improvement of stability first, because then we worry about that being our buffer, not structure. Because you want a good retention model as a personal trainer, don't hurt your clients. Yeah. Rule number one, right. that's how they'll get strong. That's how you grow a good business. That's how you actually help people, right? Um, deadlift is just usually range of motion. Uh, Before we move on to the deadlift, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two things there that you sure. address. Uh, knees over the toes and yeah. sitting back too much. Talk about both. Yeah, both well, I mean, again, like a lot of the two major camps that you're going to see with the sitting back squat, like uh, initiating the squat with an anterior tilt to the pelvis are going to be exercise models based off large groups of people. CrossFit was known for it for the longest time. CrossFit strength work came from starting strength, mm -hmm. right? It is what it is. Now, if you read the starting strength book, and I've had this conversation with starting, so I don't need death threats. I don't need cease and desist. Been there, done that. I'm cool. 
the text is different than what you see in practice. That I mean, you see proper starting strength squatters and they can squat fairly efficiently. But what you see a lot with coaches or even like with CrossFit, there is that that fear, that aversion of loading into the knees. The knees, so like patellofemoral pain with squatting is usually most commonly linked to hip instability, right? So if we can improve, we can layer on that, that vein of stability as we improve the squat mechanics, we don't have to worry about pain in the knee. There's only one research study done in 1955. Some guy named Carl Klein did a manual goineometer and measured knee laxity post-competition and, and put it up against general population just walking down the street. There was no gold standard of measurement. There was no... Um, there was no accurate control study and there was even a false equivalency drawn between is post-exercise knee laxity a a, a bad thing or b going to increase your likelihood of injury mm. one study shit was some 55 my dad's so what 63 years ago that still permeates through the literature and still gets the squats are bad for your knees that's why people squat with parallel shins wow. right so that's why i mean i i had to follow strength and conditioning research fairly closely now but I think there's people don't understand the responsibility of what happens when things are, I mean, the internet is written in indelible ink. Once that's in public, that once that's in publication, it'll never be, it'll never be, there. it'll always be cached somewhere. Yeah. Someone can cite that as a credible source, but lesson to be learned when you go from citing research, you have to appraise it too, right? So it's something that it's, I look at it as a mass exercise prescription business model as a way to overcome people who just read men's health and fitness magazines fear a version of loading the knees because they think squats they think bad for your knees they think i look at it this way squats are bad for your knees in the same way protein's bad for your kidneys yeah like if you have you know if you have some sort of nephrolithiasis or something like that like, yeah you might want to scale it back yeah if you have like a blown acl we're going to have to work on that. We're going to have to work on hamstring strength. We're going to have to work on hip stability. It could be based off a pre-existing condition, potentially damaging. And I'm not a zealot, but you got to call it as you see it. So I don't think um, the squats are bad for your knees thing. It's it just it goes what happens when bad information gets perpetuated. Yeah. Right. Because now it's worse than ever. Because now what you're having is there's such a a market drive to be educated that. It's almost like neuro linguistic programming. Like if I re if I cite a study, mm -hmm. no one's gonna go look up that study. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna. Do I challenge you because you'll find it. It's there. If the date Carl Klein, it's Carl with a K, Klein with a K, it, it exists. But if you can cite a research study now, it's almost like what Shreds was doing ten years ago. Yeah. Right. Like they were just. It's they're photoshopping the results or they're yeah. gerrymandering the method so they get the result they want. Right. Right. So it's. It's something you always got to be on the lookout of who looks to benefit from this being yes or this being no, this being positive, or this being negative. You find that, you'll find your answer, right? So it's it's something you got to be on guard because people are so quick to it. Well, in research, it's like there's research and then there's research and everyone, myself included, has their biases when it comes to training. Yep. So it's, it's something that is a sticking point for me because I need to now sift through this forest of shit when I need to find something to hang my hat on when it comes to my own training, whether it's myself or my athletes. It's, there's proven in research, and then there's proven in good research. It's totally different, right? All right. Yeah. You were going to move on and talk about the deadlift a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, deadlift for me is hip hinging. Hip hinging is misunderstood because it's too simplified. So hip hinging is it's too one-dimensional when people reference the hip hinge because hip hinge is basically, when we deadlift, the idea of training that hinge is oftentimes what you're going to see for a lot of people's starting position in their squat, that antero version of the pelvis, right? Or like um, if your pelvis is about you're tipping it forward. What you need to focus on more when you hip hinge is actually how your, that's, that's pelvic hinge. You want to worry about how your hips externally rotate, right? If I just drive my hips back and put my hips in extension, the paired motor pattern with hip extension is hip internal rotation. If I don't start screwing those feet into the floor and think of like my two knees as like, opening doors like that's the real hinge in my opinion because that loads the stability through the glute med takes the stress off the low back so deadlift is like i'm gonna a educate them on here here's this muscle here's what this does i'll do them barefoot make them create that active arch mm -hmm. from the from the hip into that into like rooting the big toe kind of staying in that um, supinated position heel so basically three points of contact generated from the hip itself then just go range of motion, right? I'm not going to start them from the floor. Let's go blocks above the knee. Let's go below the knee. Let's go to the floor. Let's go from a deficit. People are so afraid to 
load, especially thoracic flexion, mm -hmm. which is like to me, all my athletes, you teach them, if you teach them proper spinal bracing, mm -hmm. like through the lumbar spine, you should be able to load thoracic flexion without any hesitation. If we had ribs from our neck to our sacrum, I wouldn't have a job. When low back pain wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have 25% of my patients because it's when the ribs stop at T12, that's when the core comes into play. That's when like functional stability of the lumbar spine comes into play. Because if we had that structure that went all the way down, we wouldn't have to worry about it. We wouldn't have to worry about core strengthening or anything like that, even though, I mean, I'm air quoting because it's the same problem between function and action, yeah. right? The rectus abdominis, sure, when you look at it, it's a flexor of the lumbar spine based off origin insertion, and that's action. But its role is an anti-extender. When you do a plank, it's an anti-extension exercise, right? So I look at it almost the same way um, when it comes to training your upper back. So that's why I make people learn the deficit deadlift. To train with active thoracic flexion, it's like if I want to train stability of my spine, I want to be able to tuck my rib cage down. That's stability of my lumbar spine, right? That's anti-extension. Like when I do a plank, I'm not going to be you know, ass out in the air, rib cage flared up, yeah. rib cage shut down, posterior tilt of the pelvis. Watch what happens when you do that to your upper back. Your upper back is now starting to flex, right? Because your erectors, which is another stability muscle of your back, isn't an extender, it's an anti-flexor. Just like your abs aren't flexors, they're anti-extenders. It's like this safety pin model of creating spinal stability. And spinal stability is just interesting because when I referenced stability muscles before, I said they work around this Y axis. Spinal stability pretty much just works up and down, right? It works through the flexion extension plane primarily. What makes it different is that flexor multifidus, flexor rotatories, flexor intertransversaria, you can't do it. There's a there's dorsal innervation that leaves that muscle contraction independent to your control. It's totally autonomic. It's based purely off position, right? So it's about with the lumbar spine, with the core, we can you, most people can get into these positions, but like a plank in hyperextension isn't an effective plank. So the relative position of the adjacent vertebra matters, and it's the same thing with training spinal stability of the upper back. Like you want to really, if you're someone who's kind of graduated through strength and you're, you kind of get it, and you're looking to make a big jump in your strength, load your upper back, like learn how to purposefully train in like spinal flexion, like thoracic flexion, and watch your strength go through the roof. Because just like that shoulder has that neural. What are some examples oh, that you like? Oh, uh, so like anything like a, even like a cable row, something as simple as a cable row, where it's like if we're using like a closer handle on mm -hmm. a cable row to get more movement through the scapula, think of shoulder mechanics starting from the wrist. Like pronation of the wrist is going to set the trajectory for internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint. So shoulder is going to internally rotate, which is going to set the trajectory for elevation and protraction of the scap, which is going to allow for full flexion of the thoracic spine. So if you have good control from T12 to L5, your lumbar spine, you have good core control, or you're wearing a belt or whatever, I should be able to do a row and allow my shoulder blades to fully elevate and protract to allow my thoracic spine to fully flex. Because the erectors are like, if we were in Europe and you see a building with ivy climbing up, the wall mm -hmm. it's straight the ivy is doing nothing to retain the structural integrity of that wall now if that building's been there for hundreds of years and the ivy has laid roots into the brick if the foundation slips on that building the ivy will actually help retain the structural integrity that's how your erectors work they're not extending when your spine is in neutral they're only active in eccentric load when your spine starts to flex. So we can only really work them based off relative position of the vertebra, right? And that's the difference between strength and stability. You're training action or function. When you train them as anti-flexors, you're training function. So um, any kind of row with elevation and protraction, good mornings. I really like good mornings as an exercise. Like grab a safety squat bar, do good mornings that way. Um, Would you do a chest supported row that way? That's interesting because then, so I have a theory about that. I do do that. Uh -huh. um, because it allows me to train my scaps, uh, like my my rhomboids and my middle traps, to retract and depress. Mm -hmm. But I I wonder, and I have nothing to go off of, but sort of like an internal logical consistency of the autonomic nervous system is like, are those erectors as active? Because there's a external is there's an external contribution of stability coming from your chest support. So uh, that's I don't know. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I still whenever I train a row whether chest supported or not, I still train in that elevation and protraction okay. to move through what I think to be a fuller range of motion. Yeah. But I, I struggle with that. So every row you do, you, you do it in the way you just described? Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, for me, it's like, 
whether I'm doing a rhomboids or, or the intent is rhomboids or traps, like the, the pin shoulder blade, just moving the humerus on that's, that's nothing to me. I mean, that's, mm. you would gain more benefit from a length tension relationship because a lot of people, when they train rows, they train for posture, right? Mm -hmm. Pull twice as much as you, mm -hmm. uh, row twice as much as you push. It's like, be careful because your lats are internal rotators of your shoulder as well. And one would argue your lats are potentially stronger internal rotators than your pack. So you can row all you want, but if you're rowing in a way, like if you're rowing with a supinated grip, mm -hmm. that's going to keep tension on your lats the entire time. Yeah. It's not going to unlock you. If you load with a pronated grip, sure, that'll load your upper back and load your rhomboids more. So I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of a gray area yeah. where people kind of go down that rabbit yeah. hole i think that's a and this is the thing it's like uh, you know that's all, a good point because yeah. a lot of people don't think of that yeah i mean i just say like you know look at look at bodybuilders on stage in a front relaxed pose where their lats are flared where their shoulders internally rotated oh well, you look at that and it's because they think people think analogs posterior anterior chest is anterior it internally rotates back is posterior it must externally rotate it's like your lats have your lats have more in common from an action standpoint with your pecs then don't have in common with your pecs you know yeah they're extenders of the shoulder they're adductors of the shoulder um so i think there's there's something to be said about going into this much detail mm -hmm. right where most people think like i'm just muddying the waters it's like this shit matters mm -hmm. if training matters to you so yeah. i think back to your original point about the chest support to row it's still one i wrestle with yeah because it's like does that diminish the drive of the autonomic nervous system because we're externalizing like if i put a belt on that'll that'll decrease my use of my external obliques right it's not conscious it's just the way it's supporting along that fiber line so is it the same thing when i'm here yeah no no it'd be pretty cool the problem is a lot of those studies use emgs and emgs are a false correlation between muscle activation and actual muscle activity yeah right it's like an emg will spike over time under contraction but we know muscles get weaker so that can't be drawn as a as an equivalent value so that's where a lot of that's where a lot of research came out against training in full spinal, like f full thoracic flexion anyways, because they would say, oh, it reaches EMG silence. It's like those muscles are not inactive. The EMG might not be picking anything up, but A, we're dealing with seventh layer back muscles here. Like this is deep to a lot of tissue in some people. It's, you know, you're looking at centimeters thick of muscle tissue. So who's to say how accurate of a standard that is? And even with needle EMGs, if a value of an EMG is going to spike over time, but we know the strength of that muscle is decreasing or the ability to exert force is decreasing, we can't draw an equivalency between those two values. So I'm not exactly sold on the research, again, the mm. research contribution to training in that flex. Like, watch, uh, just watch the Japanese Olympic weightlifting team, like, troll the entire world. Like, they'll train these guys in the most absurd position. But guess what? When they get in those positions under a bad lift, like when they get in a snatch that gets away from them, it doesn't get away from them yeah. or they don't get hurt because yeah. they've trained the resiliency past what people think to be this like very fragile position, right? Like if you train, if you train deficit deadlifts, if you train these good mornings that look like they could potentially be dangerous, that's usually when they're the most effective mm -hmm. if implemented correctly, mm -hmm. right? It's like splitting the atom. You do it one way, you can blow some shit up. You do it the right way, you can light up the entire world, right? Yeah. So it's like whoever's pulling the strings behind that better know damn well what the exclusion criteria of who gets to do it and who doesn't, right? So just, just uh, to clarify for people listening, what rows, how do you describe a row that's for your lats oh, sure. versus one that's for more your upper back? So yeah, I mean, you it's You mentioned supinated hand position. That's it. I mean, that's so much of your body. Just like, just like I mentioned when we talk about squatting, like we'll take a look at the feet first. People, I mean, we walk around on our feet, so maybe it's a little more self-evident. People totally neglect the relationship of wrist position and shoulder mechanics, right? Like natural shoulder mechanics is that, you know, think of a, I look at a, a pitcher in baseball, probably the most emblematic or symbolic mo like movement, one of the most complex movements in sports. I fucking hate baseball. If you want to put me asleep, put on a baseball game, but I okay. could watch pitchers all day because okay. it's amazing like how much, if you lose, I forget, and these are arbitrary percentages, and it's off research, so who knows. But if you lose like a certain percentage of your hip flexion, you're going to lose almost double that in acceleration through your shoulder because mm. it's such like it doesn't make sense how these guys throw so fast. Like, because it, it, it's not so much an expression of strength as it is coordination. Like, it's such a skill, it's unbelievable. When that guy, when that ball is leaving his hand, he's 
pronation is crazy. Like it's 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 almost like the it's like an exorcism. Like it's just spinning all the way around. But that's coming like from the opposite foot, right? So that elevation protraction, like that's just as I use the the gait analysis mm -hmm. as like okay, that's what hip function is. I look at throwing almost like, hey, that's what shoulder function is. Like if we're looking to get the most out of our shoulder, that's how we utilize it. So if we're doing a row or a, like our lat pull down or something like that, if you're going pronated grip, you're diminishing the roll at the lats because the lats are internal rotators. You want to create t tension at an end range. Don't allow it to be internally rotated because again, supination is going to be an expression of external rotation of the shoulder, pronation, internal rotation of the shoulder. So when I'm here, granted grip width, will make a difference. So like if you want to target your middle back most, go maybe not. You don't want to go pronated to the point where you create ulnar deviation, which is a big problem with close grip bench pressing. Like people think there's a dose dependency relationship with things. It's fitness. Oh, I guess it's people in general, but you know, just like a close grip bench, we don't want our thumbs together because when that bars at our chest, mm. we're going to have that ulnar deviation moment. It's the same thing with rowing, right? So most people will revert to like a neutral handle for like middle back training. So we don't have any comprom compromised position at the wrist. This allows my scaps to pull out more, right? If we just think of like almost like the, the, the moment of force between my hands and my scapula, if I'm out here, it's going to be less of movement through my scaps, right? I'm not going to be able to retract as much as I'm in here. So if you want to target your lats more, do something underhand. If you want to target your upper back, your rhomboids, your traps, do something overhand, but there's a caveat from a stability standpoint. When we start working overhead, and this is something like the bro culture is really guilty of, is like you get a lot of guys, bodybuilders, even powerlifters with like shoulder impingement. If you're doing a pull up from a pronated grip position, the problem is you actually need to externally rotate first before you use your lats with your which are internal rotators, right? So if people are keeping tension in the lats, a muscle that's a very strong internal rotator of the shoulder they're not unlocking and utilizing the humerus. So what's happening? Your strength is outrunning your stability. You're purposefully keeping a partial range of motion. So you're keeping the stress into the lats for obvious reasons, right? You want to get a big back or whatever your motivation is. But if there's a huge discrepancy in the number of dead hang pull-ups you can do, like starting from totally unlocked, mm -hmm. setting that elbow to the front of the room, then engaging the lats, your orders of magnitude more likely to suffer from, suffer from anterior shoulder problems because the strength of your lats, which is an internal rotator, excuse me, is outrunning your capability of your teres minor, which is your major stability muscle in external rotation. So when you're in that bottom position, if you can only do three from here, but if you stayed in the lats the whole time, you could do 20. Your passive tension of your lats is so strong in internal rotation where you have almost nothing in that most unstable shoulder position where you need to train the function properly not to mention the axial distraction of your body pulling the shoulder out of what the little socket it rests in. That to me is like, you know, again, it's the requisite level of detail I think people need to go into in their training. Because if you can clear that out of the gate, you know, if your ego gets involved and you just want to do a pull-up, it's like you'll do it any which way. If you have to, kipping or yeah. swinging, you'll just get up there. If you start learning these bad habits, you're going to set your trajectory for, I don't get it. Like I've done pull-ups this way forever. It's like, exactly. You've been trending a course for this Titanic disaster since you started training. So I think, I mean, a long answer to a short question, but making sure that you take the requisite steps to not only know, okay, how, what am I targeting, but what is my functional bottleneck when I bring this out to five years of training to 10 yeah. years of training to, you know, the full stack on the cable or plates around my waist, where does this break down? Because if you can plan for when shit goes wrong, you can start to deviate and, and change the way you're going to program so you can continually lift throughout, like, and continually make progress, whatever your goal is. And do you find you prescribe more rows than pull-ups in general, or do you see a lot of people who shouldn't even be doing pull-ups at all? Yeah, I mean, it, you got to earn that one. Like, yeah. that one to me, like because it is such a compromised position on the shoulder, like even the kettlebell bottom under press, there's an axial compression moment happening, mm -hmm. right? The, the force of gravity is working in conjunction with the kettlebell to uh, almost approximate the joint space on the shoulder where that's working in the opposite direction. So pull-ups usually follow a progression of like leverages where it's like we're gonna start chin-ups first. Mm -hmm. Most people are strongest in chin-ups, then go neutral grip, then go pronated grip, neutral, pronated grip, wide, pronated grip, wider. Um, but each one of those has to be predicated on an improvement of functional stability to graduate to the next right so i think doing like the the band assisted then we're gonna go with gravitron or whatever mm -hmm. then go lap pull down then go body weight 
all we're doing is we're making this a really small switchboard again. Mm. Hits volume and intensity. We're making it lighter. We're doing more reps. And as we make it harder. But the thing that I always get with people, like the selling point is the grip, right? That's, it's, 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 it's the same relationship as that kettlebell where if you can get someone, most people can deadlift their own body weight. Mm. If you put a gun to their head, they could do it. Yeah. You get them on like the side of the cliff, those fingertips are going to slip open, right? But it's like, I don't understand. You can hold a bar that's your body weight, but you mm -hmm. can't hold your own body weight. It's that instability of the shoulder. It's like you might have the actual strength in your lats to do it, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be able to express that because your body's uncertain in the compromised position because you haven't trained the requisite functional stability to exert force through your lats to pull you up, right? right? So I think it's, again, if you can explain that to someone, they can understand it. You can you can layer on the progression of stability and the progression of the main movement to keep them interested. When you get to that graduation process, you're going to hit an elbow in the curve rather than like, yeah, I can do one pull up. How long have you been able to do that for? Oh, like three years. I can still just do one. It's like exactly. If your grip starts slipping, it's like there's a there's no difference in the mechanics really of your grip overhead or on a barbell. When your deadlift is going up, but your pull ups aren't. That's a huge problem in stability, right? That's kind of a the you're putting the cart before the horse. You're trying to build strength when it's like, you don't need to build more strength. You need to be able to express the strength you have. And that's where stability comes in. Yeah. What about uh, the two presses, uh, bench and overhead press? Talk about those a little bit. Some, some common problems you see and some, some, I mean, some things you do to prepare people to do them more effectively, yeah. safely. Yeah, I mean, again, I think of just like, how can I play with that stimulus switchboard, right? Mm -hmm. Rarely start someone with a barbell. Okay. Number one, because they're, again, just like with the squat, it's like they can hide a lot of their instabilities on the medium of the bar itself. So dumbbell, dumbbell, I mean, for bench press, I usually graduate, or the overhead press is a graduation to the bench press. Again, because we're scaling that, that joint motion of stability. Like if we're going to flat dumbbell press someone, I mean, I'll run six weeks of just incline, right? Like we'll go two weeks, we'll work on some, maybe some basic like rotator cuff strength. Cause I think there is a purpose and I don't want to, I don't want to muddy the waters, but there is a purpose to gain strength in someone who's detrained or untrained in the muscles that are going to then have to stabilize. Like I look at it, like you want to speak the right language in your body. It's kind of what stimulus is. Like do you speak another language. I don't come on. What's no. the last name? Ferugia. What's your family? Italian. Italian, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't speak yeah. Italian? No. Okay, but Italian's a good example, right? Like, if you had someone who was fluent in Italian and you put him in Barcelona, right? Latin based languages, Paris, even, they could they could get on a train and order lunch. That's a detrained person mm -hmm. training strength as a stimulus where stability is going to have to do down the road. They're just tourists to the gym, right? They're just they're just there for the day. Sure, we're going to do some rotator cuff strengthening, external rotation at, at neutral, external rotation at scaption, because the what they're going to, going to have to hold up to, like what their strength is capable of, is not like the demand is not going to be high. Just like if you're there on vacation, it's like well, I'm not living here. I don't really. I'm not getting Rosetta Stone fucking Spanish for yeah. my one week in Barcelona. Right. I'll get by. Right. As that begins to scale, and you go from being a tourist to a resident, like I'm, you know, what, I love Barcelona. I could move to the Gothic district of Barcelona tomorrow. I'd have to learn the fucking language. Sure. I love, oh, I love weight training. I want to, I want to be in the gym more often. Well, guess what? That strengthening of your external rotators, that strengthening of your infraspinatus, your teres minor, even to some extent or lesser extent, your subs gap and your, um, and your supraspinatus. Now, what just got you by before? You better be fucking fluent if you mm -hmm. want to live there, right? So that's kind of how I look at it. So, someone who's just starting, we might even start with strengthening. And then see how they hold up with dumbbells, dumbbell flat bench. And then you can literally take an adjustable chair and bring them to the overhead. So as you demand greater, greater uh, latent stability or greater, yeah, I mean, greater latent stability in the movement based on load. Like when you're overhead with dumbbells, way more structurally unstable than when you're at, you know, just horizontal press on flat. So two weeks make that graduation of just ticking that incline chair up one that adjustable bench goes from flat to 15 degrees 15 to 30 30 45 60 90 or 75 90. so you can literally take a week at each one of those and then each week okay we're gonna try a new stability drill if they fail at the next regression of stability drill so whether that's okay week one we're just going to do external rotation at 90 against a band week two we're going to go external rotation in scaption position with a band Week three, we're going to go overhead with that band now as it pulls you into that unstable position. Keep your elbow in front of your wrist. 
then we're going to go kettlebell, then we're going to go scap sets. Just worry about that teres minor in that top position. Because you're basically trying to prepare the stability at the angle of the shoulder that you're going to be loading. If I'm going overhead, scap sets. If I'm going perpendicular, face pulls, right? Because it's you want to be able to, again, match maybe the symptoms or the potential downfalls at that at that point of what like what they're loading, but also prepare them for the load itself. Because people usually pick one or the other. Mm-hmm. It's like they look at the exercise, or they look at the person, right? Like, oh, this exercise is bench press, so we're just going to do this is my fallout for bench press. It's like, well, if that doesn't fit the symptoms of the person, like you could have posterior shoulder impingement, less common, but it exists. What do you do then, right? Do you like do like a sleeper stretch? Do you worry about the posterior capsule, or do you just fall into your algorithm, right? So I think being able to match and movement prep for the person as well as the demand of the workout, that's when you're gonna to start to see results really quickly. Because if we just stretched right now, we went and got lunch, went and chilled, and we went and worked out, like maybe even tomorrow, we mm-hmm. went to bed, called the night, went to goals the next day and went to train, we'd have to likely do the exact same stretching, the exact same amount of volume. Because the relative, the relative red line that our nervous system knows with this transient increase of range of motion is still our own body weight. So we're still kind of going back to redlining where we were at. It's like, oh, this is still kind of weird. But if you go through mobility, stability, and then load extra physiologically, your body goes, huh, I don't feel inhibited to get into a squat right now when I wake, out of bed, wake up out of bed in the morning because we did this yesterday with like 500 pounds on our back, or 600 pounds on our back. I don't feel inhibited because I don't feel like when I'm there, I'll be at this body weight anyways. I don't feel like I'm going to get hurt because I loaded so much on top of that in this position before. So I wake up out of bed now, you know, 275, and I can go ask the grass first thing out of bed because that's how I implemented my training. It's like you can do a yoga class on Saturday if you want. You're still going to have to prep for your squats on Sunday. Yeah. But if you prep for your squats properly on Sunday, it's it's a distillation process. It's addition by subtraction. It's not a separate it's on a separate means of progressing. No one went into the weight room when they were 15 year old. And I want to be really functional and I want to be really <laughs> mobile and I want to have like yeah. a top bun and teach a <laughs> stretching class. It's like, no, you, the, the barbell kicked it to you too real and you couldn't handle what you dealt with. So you went down another Avenue. Yeah. You started like you got hurt and you got fucking gun shy and you got away from the main point. And now this is like another thing that you can progress. And it's like, get off the fucking BOSU ball and get on the barbell. That's not why you started training. Don't lie to yourself. Don't right. lie to me. That's not why you're doing it. But it's, it's a separate market now of like, we're going to be grounding. It's like, put some fucking shoes on. You're in the gym. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I'm speaking off the cuff, but it's like, there is a place for that. Sure. Yeah. But if your goal is to get strong, don't get sidetracked by this movement prep crap. Yeah. I have the shortest warm ups of anyone in my gym okay. because I know how to go through that distillation process. It's that flipping of, okay, here I'm given a perception. How do I downregulate that perception? Oh, this, this card has a brown bear on it. Oh, I remember where that other brown bear card is. Boom, it's off the table, right? Mm-hmm. So I can just sink into a body weight squat or do my gatekeeper drills, my walking lunge, my single leg RDL. It's like, okay, I can't get my foot straight when I go through that lunge. Maybe my like, biceps femoris is like tight sitting a lot i have some like residual knee issues from playing hockey i'm going to do some lateral line work with a band i'm going to integrate that with some stability change the perception load it right after okay feel pretty good get to the bottom shifting a little bit to the left maybe my calf is tight on the right and i'm getting into that demand of high dorsiflexion in the bottom of a squat and i'm shifting into my left side all right do some like gastroc pnf stuff in between my next set good all right, we're good. That's it. Warm up done. That's when, but it's the people who say, oh, just do the barbell movement. Don't, haven't done the relative leg work prior to that to yeah. have earned that. Right. And I think, but put a leash on it. Know the objective outcome of why you're doing this. You know what I mean? Like, don't turn it into a parlor trick. Like, if you, if you walk into a gym and there's someone with like his arms crossed with a barbell overhead, and he can like do that thing where they squat down mm-hmm. and then they like sit on the floor and mm-hmm. then like fold it. It's like, yeah. or you put a guy with like 800 on the bar, he's gonna take it to the fucking house and rack it. Dude, no one cares. No yeah. one cares what you're doing. Yeah. Please just put a shirt on and go away. Yeah. That's the main show. Yeah. Because it's, I think it's primal, it's instinctual. It's like when you're trapped under a suburban, you want to be, you want that guy in the passenger yeah. seat. Yeah. You don't want Gumby man trying to like worm his way out the side. That, you're no good to anyone, right. right? When shit hits the fan, 
like, what are you going to be able to do? Like when the apocalypse and inev- when California inevitably drops off, yeah. like when we're seven feet underwater and we're 16 floors up, who do you want on your team? Right. right? And I mean, it's a weird way of looking at it. I know. And it's a meathead way of looking at it, but I think it's people just lose sight. No one, no one go- goes into the gym and wants that as a pursuit. Mm-hmm. And people who are busy, people who have jobs, wise, and they don't want to fucking, I don't want to be doing mm-hmm. mobility work for an hour. No. Get me on the barbell. All right, sweet. That's who I want to work on. Yeah. That's here is the most effective, eff- effective and efficient way to get you where you need to be. Yeah. You can do something right. It might not be the right thing to do. Right. And that's mm-hmm. where people get tripped up. Is it effective? Is it efficacious? Mm. That's what, that's the realm you need to live in. That's the level of detail and the level of education, the level of understanding you need to be at. If you're going to take this on yourself, most people don't want to do that. Delegate to someone who's willing to do that. Mm. Right. Because I couldn't imagine having kids first and foremost, but like where, like I barely have time to train myself and I don't even think I have a real job and my jobs that I do have are in a gym and I'm like, oh, how do I find the time? God, yeah. I, I am so, I am so right. disciplined. It's like, dude, the gym is right there. You right, asshole. Right. Like, right. but if you have that, like likely that it, I could speculate, that might be the high point of your day. It's the high point of my day. Mm-hmm. But if you have that much responsibility in such a little time, that time becomes ever more precious. So if you have someone who's like, you know, we're going to do some like deep breathing drills. We're going to get on and we're going to like lacrosse ball from head to toe. It's like, tell me what I need to do so I can squat today, squat tomorrow, squat next year, squat five years from now. Yeah. Okay. That's all you need to hear. But it's just like, again, it's, it's, it's either lack of education or it's a drive in the market. Again, people, people vote with their dollars. If you're going to keep buying into this shit, it's still going to exist. Yeah. But I think at least I think like with like the audience that you reach, people who are more education driven, by the time we've reached this level of, I don't want to like this, maybe this level of depth. People are listening to willing to listen to long form stuff. They just want to get educated. Yep. There's no other reason you listen to me talk. Literally none. If you're trying to derive something from training, sure, that's it. Anything other than that, you wouldn't listen, right? So I think having that, again, exclusion criteria is going to be huge. This isn't for everyone. Yeah. Only, only the serious may need apply for that kind of stuff, right? Jordan, do you generally set up your programs based around those big four lifts, like one day each for now? No. I mean, no. variations of them? or Yeah, I mean, well, it's like, hard to pick gym movements that aren't variations of yeah. them. Uh, yeah. I think, I mean, I always start, I treat a lot of my online clients like I would treat a client in my office, right? Because again, I'm contingency planning because mm-hmm. it's it's lifestyle. It's what do you want out of it, right? Like yeah. you want to run a marathon? It's exclusion criteria. If you want me to program for you for a marathon? No, sorry. Here, yeah. I have seven other friends who are way better than this than I am. You know, put on some size and you want to get strong. You want to do it safe. You want to do athletic preparation. That's what I'm saying. Like, like the average guy listening who's in his 30s, 40s, 50s, how would you program for him in general? Like what's, what's Oh, what's start. Like, I mean, start with, because like, here's the thing. Four days. Is it upper level? Well, that's the thing. You're going to start with lifestyle first, yeah. right? Because I don't worry about training until I know about the recovery, right? Because yeah. like you could overtrain someone on three days a week. Yeah. Easily. Sure. If he's high stress job constantly, and that's what I run into in the Bay Area, is like, you know, I got directors and executives and CEOs that it's like, oh man, I got to go to Munich tomorrow or I got to be in Shenzhen um, on the last flight out. Yeah. Not going to be able to train. If the, Sometimes the best thing I can tell one of those guys is, hey, take the day off. Yeah. Right. And they, they're high powered. They're, you know, they're, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, they're high powered. Like they have high stress, they have a lot of responsibility, they have a family. So for me, it's how do you, it's about fatigue management, number one. Yeah. I don't want to make, training is a stress. Yeah. Right. Stress is stress. Your body responds to stress, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, whether a Bengal tiger walks in the room right now or your girl breaks up with you or something like that, your body only knows one, you know, that HPA axis is how you're going to respond to it. Yeah. Knowing how that's going to fall out is going to dictate how we train. So it's, I mean, uh, lifestyle's big in my intake forms, past injury. Mm-hmm. What limitations am I, do you, do you have a bulging disc from college ball? Do you have a done ACL? Have you had surgery, car accidents, breaks, hospitalizations, fractures? Are you genetically predisposed to things do you have ehlers danlos do you have um uh did you have a collagen vascular disorder so work on standardizing the recovery piece first what's your diet like how much sleep are you getting how many hours and screen time do you have what's your commute like Mm -hmm. these are all things on my online training intake form Mm -hmm. that is more important than whatever the goal is because the goal doesn't matter because you're not going to reach it if we can't program around this stuff first we're lucky i get to control a lot of my training variables it's easy for me to get in 6,000 calories a day. I can eat my meals whenever I want. I can train whenever I want, roughly speaking. So, but for the average person, it's like, 
we have work gym and then I'll be in hotel gyms. It's like, okay, I need to know what we're working with, what the goal is, what the fatigue management is, what the past history is, what the lifestyle is. Then the train, the training is easy. Yeah. Then you just, it's, you got to know what pegs with the shape of the peg you're putting in. And like, you can't go square peg into round hole. It's not going to work. Once you have that, then it's just scaling exercises. When you've been doing it as long as I have, it's becomes easy because mm. it's, it's the same spectrum, whether it's corrective exercise programming within a program to it's the same spectrum of stimulus from injured to healthy, to healthy, to strong, right? It's just the continuation there. And so it's just figuring out where we need to draw the borders for you of like, okay, what's your ability to actually perform? What's your ability to recover from that performance? How tight do those borders have to be on that spectrum? And where do we place then the exercise selection is volume intensity, all that's. That's easy. Anyway, yeah. I could employ someone to do reps and sets from there, but it, the exclusion criteria of who gets to do what exercises when is that's that takes a little bit more experience. It takes a little bit more yeah. of a of seeing where it all goes wrong. Like I've learned so much just from my own training. I'm not the strongest guy in my gym, not by a long shot. When you get guys that are pulling 800 on a regular, and go, huh? I wonder why his bicep snapped. I should probably look into that. But I can answer that question and learn from that mistake. Right. Sometimes shit's just going to break. Right. But it's if I've had like 10 pipes and they're all bursting in the same spot when we put pressure through it, I'm going to reinforce that part of the pipe before I put any pressure through it. So it's kind of like experience when things go wrong and then reverse engineering back from that point. And then every time something goes wrong for someone, it's like, oh, OK. All right. That's a potential that could go wrong. We need to plan for that. Now, where on that? in that reverse like sort of chronological order could we have screened for that to happen what exercises can we use to bolster that position what things should we avoid or what mobility drills or stability drills should we implement so it's like it's a lot of it is reverse engineering um but i i, don't, I think i've deviated so far away from the question now it doesn't <laughs> even matter but um I think managing the fatigue part first, back yeah. to the original question, is like the lifestyle. What can you recover from? Because I'm not going to dig you into a deeper hole because yeah. you're not going to get anywhere, right? You, that cortisol spikes. You're, so for that guy you described, you tend to give him three days a week in general? Who's three to five. Out, oh, stressed you? out. Yeah, three to five. Depends. It depends on what their response is to training. Like if okay. it start them with three, then scale up. Okay. Because if they're getting a beneficial physiological and psychological response to stress reduction, mm -hmm. if they can fit it in their schedule and they can make time for it and they can get their meals right, it actually starts to have a cascade effect where they start to recover better mm -hmm. the more they train. Very structured, very disciplined people. The alarm goes off. They have to be. They have too much shit to do in the day yeah. to be effing off and doing stupid shit. Yeah. But if they can block it in, it makes them more productive. Yeah. Like there's the research on like, I think it's like prefrontal cortex activity after exercise. That's why all corporate, corporate, uh, big, big corporate design hubs have these massive gym facilities now. Yeah. And yeah, go work out on the clock because guess what? You're going to finish a set and then you're going to make the iPhone 11. Right. So yeah, good on it. It's <laughs> right. cheaper than microdosing, right? Yeah. So I think there's such a benefit over time to scaling up because mm -hmm. it keeps them regimented. Like yeah. if we, if they have half hour, but they can do half hour, six days a week, mm -hmm. we're going to go six days a week or seven yeah. days a week, right? Yeah. Because there's, it's the psychological component that gets a little bit. It's and, a, and that's huge because I know so, as you must in your area there, I know so many type A successful people that will go, they might be 45 years old when they start training, but they're like, yo, I do stuff and it has to be part of my daily routine and my habits. So I have to go out of the gate from zero training to six or seven days a week. Yeah. And they do it. And they, they yeah. never stop training. Like, yeah. that's just it forever. It's just high functioning. Yeah. And you can't. You, they're going to find someone to say yes to yeah. that'll yeah. say yes to them. Cause guess what? If they're like that, people don't say no to them. Right. Right. When you're bringing home like, yeah. you know, tens of millions a year, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to have someone say, no, here's what we're going to do. We're going to three days a week. It's like, all right, let's get this yeah. guy doing 20 minute sessions. Yeah. And like we'll you just... can't tell them they're going to overtrain. They've never even heard of that concept. Exactly. Like, yeah. Whatever. Dude. And anything in that position that's worth doing to them is worth overdoing. Yeah. Right. So I think just being able to get them on board and then just the old bait and switch. Like yeah. you can just, you get them trained six days a week, but they're 25 minute sessions, yeah. right? Maybe yeah. with like some intensity interval training in between, or, yeah. you know, get them some sort of metabolic stimulus in, in your mind. There. That's active recovery day. Yeah. Right. But to him, it's like, oh, if you, it, would you have a guy lift six days a week? Like you pull, push, push lower. Three um, times? Again, depends on the ability to recover maybe yeah. a little bit more advanced, train but four days and, and do in an initial phase if someone's really eager and their mechanics aren't terrible. If you think about like, putting them in positions 
where the loading parameter will self-govern how much force you can put through, counterbalance squat someone every day. Yeah. Because they're going to fail in the shoulders. Yeah. Right? The shoulders will be sore, sore the next day, and they'll just be doing counterbalance with nothing, with air, right? Yeah. But don't say, hey, we're going to squat three times a week with a barbell in a low bar position. Mm. This day is going to be dynamic effort. This day is going to be higher intensity. This day is going to be max effort. Because they're going to feel good and they're going to open up. And your ability to open up on a low bar squat mm. way outruns your ability from a stimulus input standpoint to open up on a counterbalance. So it's mm. how do I make this hard without being hard on them, mm -hmm. right? And subjectively, that's what people want is they just want a good workout, right? Yeah. That's why CrossFit was so unbelievably sure. successful. Yeah. People are like bleeding from the lungs, but that's what they want. That's <laughs> yeah. what they wanted. They wanted that experience of, you know, again, efficacy versus effectiveness. It's a coin flip, right? Mm -hmm. Is is toes to bar and max effort deadlifts a good thing to put together? I'm not a judge or jury, but they were able to give people a good workout without them knowing what a good workout consists of. They just it was subjectively difficult. Yeah. If you can make it subjectively difficult without being objectively hard in the grand schema of training, mm -hmm. that's that's the art of it, right? Yeah. So I think you need to tailor to them because if someone's gonna Someone's going to willing to pay the money, they're going to find someone who's going to curate yeah. to them. So it's yeah. like, you know, if, you know, I'm not going to run a, a west side block. All right, we're going to do reverse bands and chains. It's like, dude, I got 45 minutes. Right, right. I got to put what on? What are these briefs that I need yeah. to buy? Like, <laughs> that's, going to take, that's going to take seven friends and like 45 minutes just to get dressed for the gym. Yeah. It's like being able to to scale and work within there, just kind of like green beret it behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, it's called coaching for a reason. Like, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of good coaches playing sports and the best thing about the coaches that I've had is they allow you to make decisions that you felt like were your idea. They just mm -hmm. led you down. They just, and you look back and now you're like, huh, no shit. All right. Yeah. It's like, if they told you outright to do it, you'd immediately have that linguistic problem. You're like, ah, oh, I don't know if I want to oh, go do that. It's like, no, fuck you man. Like I'm not doing that cause you told me to, but if they just, if you, if you just leave the right trail of breadcrumbs and you just get them to follow it, then they get to the end result. And like, oh, I'm so proud of myself. It's like, good job. But it, that's what you need to do. And so much of it's just overcoming the psychological and getting them. If they knew how to do it, they would do it themselves. Yeah. That's why they're seeking advice. But it's like so many people can just lead that trail to a very bad place. Like just lemming their clients right off a cliff. Then it ends up in our hands going, oh, fuck, all right, how do we have to reverse engineer this? Right. Yeah. Put, I honestly, most of my job is like, I feel like uh, Humpty Dumpty. Like, all the king's horses and all the king's men, that's my job. Putting back together just disaster pieces that have been put totally. through the ringer of the conventional model of training. Yeah. yeah. Are there any uh, recovery methods that you like, anything you do regularly, you prescribe for people outside of what you do in your own practice? I think walking is really mm. underrated, especially for like power it. athletes. Like yeah. you wanna look on like how to decompress your lower back. Don't, the 20 minutes you'd spend on your inversion table, or suspended upside down from some fucking giant rubber band on a squat rack. Yeah. Go for a walk. Go yeah, for a walk. Love it. Your disc will thank you. I think it's so underrated, like improving, like again, having metrics of what recovery is other than subjective, right? Like there's a big push for HRV right now. Mm -hmm. Do resting blood pressure. Do your blood pressure in the morning. Before there's a deviation in your HRV, there's gonna be a deviation in your blood pressure first. Do that. Do blood glucose. Do um, yeah, I'm not huge on like a biometrics from like a sleep standpoint. Like mm -hmm. I think that's really subjective work on improving supplementation for your sleep or habits for your sleep, blue light, reducing glasses, uh, uh, dose magnesium or, um, whatever the, the other common figure out a way to improve the recovery that you were already doing rather than going down the rabbit hole of like some of the more marketed things to improve recovery, you know, you're guns and things like that. I think anytime you can internalize a stimulus, this is like a good, a good rule. It's going to be more effective, right? Like if muscle contraction is the same, whether I put like a, like a neuro stim on your bicep mm -hmm. or I put a bi uh, dumbbell in my hand, if the stimulus, if the outcome is the same, that bicep contracts, the bicep relax, everyone would be jacked out of their minds with complex and it's just hanging out of their pockets. Yeah. On, I'd have complex on each one of my calves right, right now, right. but it's because that stimulus is external that it's not effective, right? Like with a lacrosse ball, it's like, yeah, you know, the myofascial release gets overdone. Like, oh, you want to put a lacrosse ball on your hip? 
you know what changes the relative perception or length of like you're not breaking up scar tissue you know what might break up scar tissue eccentric loading you know what I mean? Like loading that stimulus internally. Or if you're going to put a lacrosse ball in the in the teres or something in the shoulder, move it. Move it around. That'll actually change length and perception, right? Like jam a lacrosse ball in your armpit and keep that elbow tucked in and almost like go through an unloaded kettlebell bottom under press. Feel how much more effective that is, right? So yeah. whenever you can internalize that stimulus of recovery, right? Like you can use like compression boots to increase blood flow or you can walk to increase blood flow. That internal stimulus is gonna be tenfold more mm. effective at least. So that's kind of like a, my rule of thumb with recovery is how can I make this happen by myself without looking elsewhere to have external modalities mimic the, r- the restorative effect of something that I could potentially do on my own. Gotcha. T- uh, tell us a little bit about Prescript. Oh yeah, so Prescript.com is where we're currently doing a lot of our corrective exercise programming. Um, it's kind of, a it was born sort of out of necessity, like with office visits being, I mean, I have longer office visits, but with a, a lack of adherence to corrective exercise, like your doctor, if you had a chest infection, mm-hmm. your MD wouldn't go, all right, we're going to, um, we're going to give you a doxycycline, we're going to give you an antibiotic, and I want you to come in tomorrow, and I'm going to give you another one. It's like, give me a fucking bottle, man. Like, what do I got to come back here for? That's a, one of the major barriers of energy entry of people into like chiropractic, right? And and rightfully so. Like it's it's a very bad business model when it's executed like that. Like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. You know, Jay, you're gonna have to come in tomorrow. Real bad news. Uh, we're gonna have to take x-rays and we're gonna have to adjust you forever. Sorry, this is the way your spine looks, that's life. I my office visits are were I mean they are still to assess for structure or function. Mm-hmm. With what you have, is it structural or is it dysfunction? Or if it's structural, can we potentially out damage bad or out structure, out function bad structure, regardless if it's morphology or pathology, right? Whether it's I got into a car accident, okay, so did I. Uh, There's a Chevy Suburban in San Jose, California that's driving around with my left labrum on my shoulder as a fucking hood ornament. I got T-bone on my bicycle, never had surgery, but it's out function bad structure, right? Damage structure, you can't pick your parents and you can't tell that girl to stop at the stop sign, right? It's life happens. Unless your answer is, I'm going to go for surgery, then we start to figure out the functional plan, right? So what I was running into was, I don't like running a dependency model in my practice. I, that's why I deal with professional athletes. It's mm-hmm. like, they they want to get better. They will do what I tell them. So Prescript was like, I'm going to create an index, a library of scalable corrective exercise interventions that'll go bring people from injured to healthy, but be able to progress them from healthy to strong, right? So it's something that I'll implement in isolation on prescript, it's like you have upper body. The people usually reach out like, hey, I have this, this, and this. We have to base off dysfunction. I'm not practicing medicine online. It's pure, it's, it is in a sense an adjunct to your training. So whatever your training is, you, you kind of uh, superimpose like the prescript movements, which are progressions of uh, uh, static stretching, dynamic stability work that integrate in and co- follow common patterns of dysfunction. Um, and then it's something I'll use in practice. I'll use those videos when someone leaves my office. They have, rather than leaving with one doxycycline down the hatch, they leave with the bottle. Here is what here is your progression. Check in in two weeks. We'll see how you're doing. And more often than not, improving the function based off their assessment, finding that that the the, the bookends of where they should be falling on a spectrum of kind of dynamic input. Some people are so immobile that dynamic stability work is a moot point. Some people have to do static stretching for four weeks because they can't possibly get into unstable position. But th- those bookends move over time. I have people, myself included, I rarely have to stretch now because all my all that perception of length can be altered by stability, right? I can get into unstable positions easy and then I load and then I'm good. I can stay always to the right of that spectrum. And then so we use it in private practice and then I use it integrated with my training. So like. Prescript in isolation right now is just the corrective exercise piece. In my office, I use it as an adjunct with treatment. And in my online training with my clients, I do it with exercising correctly, which I found to be something that I'm moving towards. Um, a lot of my clients now in office are asking me to train them remotely. Again, Silicon Valley. No one wants to wait on the 101 to get to Mountain View to come see me. Yeah. Tell, give me the whole picture, yeah. right? Here's my condition. Here's, because as good as... As effective as we have been, I don't want to say as we are, as we have been, maybe we've just been really lucky in the last couple of years, for programming corrective exercise, 
this will fly in the face of poor exercise programming. Mm. From a stimulus input standpoint, this can be this prescript piece can be a gnat into an elephant's ass, right? Like if you're doing a Bulgarian method for Olympic weightlifting and you're squatting like 13 times a week at 98% of your front squat or whatever, like not all the corrective exercise in the world can can hold up to that level of acute bouts of of fatigue and then accumulative chronic fatigue that that training cycle. So what I've been having now is a lot of my clients are, we're integrating that prescript piece to adjunct or to complement a full periodized program Mm -hmm. of exercise as a whole, right? And then that way we can switch the dials on the movement preparation side and we can also alter all the the breadth of stimulus that we can put into a single training session, into a single training block, into a training season. So that's been, we found that to be the most effective and something we're looking to expand on more because there are self limitations in just putting that work in in isolation, even though we've been able to out corrective exercise a lot of bad exercise when we can get control of both we do extremely extremely well mm. just as a quick aside there you mentioned the bulgarian method and, yeah you know higher frequency has become like a thing like the yeah. thing du jour over the last couple of years uh generally what do you like to see people train again i know it depends on yeah. the progression where they're at like twice a week hitting hitting a, 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 a movement patterns tw- three times a week Oh, like when it, like maybe just like a squat. Yeah, I yeah. mean, again, it depends where they're at upper limits. Like, well, the nice thing with a front squat is that it's not max stimulus, right? Mm-hmm. Like the nice thing with a snatch, is it's not even close to max stimulus. There's a lot of speed involved. Yeah. And I think you get a little bit more leeway with accumulating uh, chronic fatigue from the force production from the primary stimulus of acceleration rather than mass. Like when I peak for a powerlifting meet, I'll squat twice a week okay. and it's fucking brutal mm-hmm. like there's no it's a different it's essentially putting yourself in a car accident mm-hmm. so it's whatever again whatever you can recover from yeah from a main movement standpoint i think if you're focusing i can understand doing like a like a squat like a training block like that mm-hmm. but if you're year round squatting three times a week one of your other lifts or one of your other movement patterns is deficient. Mm. Guarantee you, I put you out in that like in out of that sagittal plane. You have nothing, mm. right? So, again, if your sport is Olympic weightlifting, specificity is going to play a role. But if you say so specific that your your box, your ability to move gets so small that any deviation out of that plane is going to lead to an injury, it's like how effective then is that training program when it sets you up to be injured for, and you're out for four to six weeks, yeah, or eight to twelve weeks, right? So I think being able to step off the barbell is huge. Like when I finish a meet, I don't touch a barbell for eight weeks, minimum, mm. right? Cause I've just spent the better part of 16 weeks on somewhat of a linear progression, progressive overload of three of the heaviest lifts I can do. And then that last four weeks is just, it's, I, I'm reluctant to like, you know, the super compensation theory of nervous system adaptation, but I'm just trying to test the upper limits of my coordination under heavy fatigue. Then when I rest, go to the meet, come in. I mean, you can when you do this long enough, you can squat in your sleep, right? You don't have yeah. to think about it. Um, but I would say, you know, the old adage is the best exercise program is the one you're not doing. To a lot of sense, that's true because stimulus is something that we adapt to so quickly. And if you want to start making change, novelty is huge, mm. right? Being whether that's a psychological, like fuck, man, I've been squatting, squatting so boring. Like there's only so many times I can listen to the Metallica Black album and get mad <laughs> before it's like, yeah. you know, put me on a sled, right? Yeah. Who sled pushes? Like if you're not getting sore anymore, likely not that delayed onset muscle soreness is a good indicator of progress, but keeping someone psychologically engaged is usually the rate limited training frequency. Yeah. Like yeah. you talk to my business partner, Jordan Genta is an Olympic weightlifter and he's deranged. It's like he, he trains with Cal strength and they train nine sessions a week. I'm like, dude, you know, there's only seven days in a week, right? <laughs> yeah. But like he's doing double sessions and it's just like, at least with powerlifting, it's like, oh, I'm going to use like the safety squat bar. I'm going to use like deadlifts off blocks or I'm going to do some lunges or leg press or whatever or dumbbells. Their whole workout is on you're fucking deranged, man. It's the same barbell with like a little bit more weight for different movements. And it's just like, but they love it. Yeah. And they can run a Bulgarian method. Run, and guess what? Why the Bulgarian method is famous? They're really good weightlifters, mm-hmm. right? So I think for a base population person who wants to maybe find that passion instilled in them, 
giving them a breadth and ability to s experience a lot of different things that mm. encompass barbell yeah, training or yeah. weight training, yeah. then skim the surface, l let them dive in, yeah. right? Rather than like, all right, Susan, a mother of three kids, Bulgarian method. Yeah. I want you wearing nothing but blue Adidas track suits all week. <laughs> Here's your fanny pack. Don't smile at anyone. You're yeah. now an Olympic weightlifter. It's yeah. like, you know, we're going to do some dumbbell cleans. Oh, I really like that. Like, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, we'll maybe put some like uh, some some hang clean work off with a barbell into your next training program. And then maybe in a year or two, if she wants it, I want. I really want to do Olympic weightlifting. Okay. But that's, again, that's good coaching, yeah. right? That's not saying here's what we're doing. It's setting the trail of breadcrumbs, but it's allowing allowing any n number of trailheads of breadcrumbs to exist for your clients, especially out of the gate, right? Like if I have a powerlifter, it's like, so what about cross? Have you thought about CrossFit? I think you'd be really good CrossFit. Like, fuck off, man. I got to meet in eight weeks. Yeah. And it's like, all right, we're, this is how we're going to progress. But for the, the average population, which a lot of people don't realize is the bulk of the fitness industry, mm -hmm. right? Totally. Me and oh, you yeah. are not consumers yeah. of the fitness industry, right? right? Totally. So allowing people to have that, that breadth of stimulus to start and then allowing them to choose, but having the tools in the toolbox, like, okay, you want to go Olympic weightlifting? You want to go, you want to do more kettlebell work? You want to barbell work? Hypertrophy style training? Be able to... To, to play to the crowd sort of thing, but yeah. allowing them to choose what stimulus. Such a great point is the psychological. And, and you mentioned that cliche, the, the, the program. There's also the, the, the cliche, the best program for you is the one that you're gonna do and enjoy too. Sure. Yeah, like, yeah, I know yeah. guys who've been training for 30 years and you could tell them whatever study about frequency being better, they're like, bro, I'm doing a five day split once a week. Yeah. I don't give a fuck what study yeah. there is because I'm bored. Like yeah. I don't wanna press more than once a week. And yeah. it's like, whatever, cool, do it. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point because I think, and that's, that's a barrier of, of entry that you'll never, that it's the hardest to break. Yeah. Right. Is the psychological. And I think only people who've been doing this a while realize that in that relationship, that's your bottleneck. But yeah. if you can tap into that, you're good. Yeah. Right? And a lot of that's program for them for a while, let them trust your programming. Yeah. Then when they come to you with maybe like, Hey, why don't you switch it up? Oh, we thought about this. Yeah. They know that you'll be able to guide them successfully because you've been able to tailor to them first. Like it's yeah. definitely a long game yeah. play when you're working because as it should be right. The price from a business standpoint, the price of the price of retention is always less than the price of acquisition. Right? Yeah. So if you're a high turnover rate trainer, so you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time mm -hmm. getting new clients. Yeah. Right. So if you can do a good job and service your clients properly with what they want and then allow them to explore out and still give them that value, with whatever avenue they choose, yeah. people are gonna come to you like, I don't have enough time, sorry. Which sucks, but then, you know, start training up someone underneath you, start spreading spreading the wealth sort of thing. But yeah, the because the science thing will only get you so yeah. far, yeah. right? Because people, it's it's Monday somewhere, it's a fucking chest day, dude. Yeah. I don't care what yeah, the yeah, research yeah. says. Yeah, yeah. I get that for yeah. sure. Totally. Yeah, man. All right, where can everybody find you and follow you online? Okay, um, so Instagram is at, the underscore muscle underscore doc doc um website is www.themuscledoc.com uh www.pre-script.com that's s-c-r-i-p-t as all our corrective work podcasts on google play store and itunes is rx radio rx apostrophe d radio uh and personal email is jordan at the muscle doc.com if you have questions and then on any of those sites they could find where you're speaking or any live events you're doing instagram seems to be the hub for all that okay. this day yeah so summer will be fairly busy dallas maine uh dallas maine uh where else am i going uh vegas australia yeah, it's all it's all online. Nice. Yeah. Awesome, brother. This yeah. is great. Yeah, Thank I appreciate you so much. having me, man.